All right. I am privileged this evening to be joined by Javon Edmonds. Uh, Temple University covers Temple for OwlScoop.com and the Philadelphia Inquirer. Uh, glad to have you on late notice. Uh, thanks for joining me, Javon. Oh, anytime, anytime. Yeah. Anything to help out the rivals family. Awesome, awesome. So, uh, obviously, we got another midweek game for UCF. It seems like every single game has been during a weekday. Last week, they played SMU on a Wednesday night. That was delayed a few games, a uh, few days because of Hurricane Ian coming through the state of Florida. Uh, Temple obviously had this past Saturday off as well as they get ready for this midweek game. So, uh, before we kind of talk about this matchup and everything, I know this is kind of a year of transition for Temple. Uh, you know, one thing that, you know, I think, you know, people need to understand Temple has been, you know, a really good football program throughout the American, uh, you know, going back to, you know, even, you know, it's the Big East days, um, you know, Al, Al Golden was an excellent coach. You know, he left to go to Miami, bringing Steve Adazio. He kind of continued that going. He left to go to Boston College and Matt Rule comes in obviously helps elevate simple to another level i think they won the american um athletic uh, conference championship i think it was 2016 when pj walker was the quarterback he leaves and goes to Herman Herman. we're dueling it out in the american for a few years yeah yeah and so jeff collins comes in after that he keeps everything going I think it was only there a couple of years and he goes on to georgia tech so i mean there was a pretty good thing going at simple until and, uh, pat craft takes over and hires roger Kelly. Yeah, I guess I was going to ask you about because it was it was some dreadful times. I know there was COVID in between everything, and that obviously was tough to deal with. But uh, what was it like last season? You know, once you got back to somewhat normalcy and, and full stadiums, uh, I guess as they could be, and and that season kind of just fell apart. I think it was what a seven game losing streak to end this in the year, and you know players were jumping in the portal. So, uh, what was your take on that area? Were you surprised? I guess you wouldn't weren't really surprised when they decided to part ways with Rod Carey. Oh, not at all. I'll tell you, um, the only full stadium was homecoming against Memphis, and that was it. Uh, fans did not care for Rod Carey's Temple team in his final two seasons. Um, it, I, I knew it was coming to like a boiling point once Arthur Johnson was named the new athletic director, and once Rod started getting speed with the media. Like, <laughs> that's not new. He snapped on me one day, and I'm like, he knows he feels the heat. He's gone after this year. Is not even anything to worry about. Um, as he had told the media, I can't remember what game it was, but he told us in the post-game presser before he even went to Dewan Mathis that he was going to give Justin Lynch, who was the backup at the time, some more snaps. So he told us before he told his own starting quarterback that he was going to take some of his starting quarterback snaps away. We asked really? Dewan. So we talked to Dewan about it because he comes up after Rod. And right. then we don't talk to Rod again until Monday. You know how it goes. And we're yeah. talking to him like, hey, we've heard from Dewan. He didn't hear it from you. Boom, boom, boom. And Rod just like snaps on me. I'm like, hey, man, you shouldn't have told us that you were going to take your starter's minutes away before you told your starter. Like, that's on you. That's uh, that's crazy. That's crazy. So so tell us, I guess, a little bit about Stan Drayton. Um, I'm, I'm going to run a slideshow here. Just to have some pictures going on. This was last year's uh, game. Uh, for the UCF played at the link and everything. But Stan Drayton obviously uh, comes in. I know uh, for people, you know, UCF fans, you know, I know he was at University of Florida for a few years back in the day. He's been at Texas. He's got a lot of experience and everything. Uh, just what's the early reception been like with would Stan coming in and take it over Temple? Do you think he's a coach that kind of gets it and maybe understands what it's going to take a little bit better than Rod did of what it takes to win in, in Philly? Oh, absolutely. Rod Carey was very against the establishment and anti-tradition. That's not who Stan Drayton is. Stan Drayton has been the antithesis of Rod Carey. He's been bringing alumni back. He's been pushing this, pushing Temple toughness. Um, you got to earn your single digits. Uh, he's got... And, and I just did a story on it for the Inquirer, not to plug my work. Um, a, a leadership council of players, 14 players, and that's very uncommon in college yeah. football. They're, you know, college football is the closest thing to a monarchy that Americans will ever see up close and, pers uh, up close and personal. It's the head right. coach, and he controls everything and does not have to cede any power if he wants. And Drayton's like, no. I'm in my 50s. Like, there's clearly a disconnect between me and the guys in the locker room. I've been there before. 
but this is their team now. They can disseminate my message and tell me how the locker room is feeling and come to me with any suggestions and let me know what's going on. And we can make this a working relationship. Um, yeah, Stan Drayton, he's put together a better staff than Kerry did. Um, he's got more energy. He knows his football. I'll tell you that much. Um, the, the Stan Drayton era has a lot of potential at Temple. Yeah. I'll tell you that. Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, I've seen this day and age. I mean, players, they've got to be involved in the process because, you know, if you don't have a good relationship with your team, you can lose your roster overnight in the transfer portal and everything. And I think UCF, you mentioned leadership council. That's something I think UCF's had something similar. Um, I think maybe when Josh Heupel was the head coach and obviously it's kind of maintained when Gus Malzana, I think, I think they have something like that where they maybe have a representative from, you know, each of the classes, you know, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, and maybe have some overall leaders. And they, they those are kind of the, the guys who kind of go with the coach, go to the coaching staff with concerns or issues are kind of kept in the loop. So that sounds good and everything. So what's, what's kind of been the verdict on this early start for, for, for Temple? Uh, I know there's, you know, some early wins. What is it against uh, Lafayette and UMass? Got a really close defeat uh, against Rut against Rutgers. I think there was a Duke game in there that, I guess that maybe might been the game where that necessi- necessitated uh, necessitated the quarterback change. So what's what's kind of been the you know after last season? I don't know what the expectations were, but how's the early season been for Temple? Better than expected. I will say I didn't expect a thirty zero blowout down at Duke. I went down there. Um, I wasn't on call to write for that game, so I kind of was a little happy about that because it got real ugly <laughs> real quick. And that was the last game that DeJuan Mathis started at quarterback for Temple, um, which I thought it was the right move to replace him. I had been saying since last year that I don't think DeJuan Mathis is a high-level FBS starting right. quarterback. Um, and apparently the coaching staff felt the same way. E.J. Warner comes in – because we've got to remember, I, I just – I just lied. Dewan started against Lafayette also. He okay. got benched in that game for EJ Warner. And it ever was, since then, it's been EJ as a starter. It's been EJ's show. And EJ is, of course, the son of Hall of Fame quarterback, Kurt Warner. Of course. Um, EJ comes in, lights up Lafayette, does, he impresses against Rutgers. And Temple had Stan Drayton not gone for it on fourth down in Rutgers territory several times. Temple probably wins that game. Like, the Rutgers could not score whatsoever and Noah Vedral wasn't playing so they had Gavin Wimsett and I wish I could remember the other guy's name but like two quarterbacks who you know are backups for a reason playing right right um go ahead they beat UMass I'm big on the quality of your win and how you won the defense did what it was supposed to do against the Minutemen the offense it got sketchy so then you get to Memphis which I was expecting a loss. Temple and Memphis have never beaten each other in consecutive matchups. Temple won the homecoming game last year. I was on the call for that great game, great atmosphere. So they had to lose this one, especially down there in Memphis at the Liberty yeah. Bowl. Um, I didn't expect it to look that bad. Um, and Memphis was looking better. They were on their way to beating Houston last week until somehow you know Houston overcame a 19-point deficit in the fourth quarter to pretty much choke that one away. But Memphis was looking a little bit better than I thought people expected until that game. <laughs> yeah, I, I wasn't expecting them to do that because this is not one of the good Dana Holgerson years at Houston. This is one of the right. head-scratching years that he's very prone to. So I did not expect Memphis to sell that game out. Um, but, yeah, that game happens. They go into bye week. Temple's offensive line is banged up and who they do have out there is who they would start, like, if they were fully healthy. Yeah. And the unit just isn't that good. And we all know if you don't have an offensive line, you don't have a football team. It's that simple. Temple's dead last in the American and 126th out of 131 qualifying teams in total rushing. They average just under 87 yards per game on the ground, 2.7 yards per carry. You can't win with that whatsoever. Um, So it's – the, the defense is way better than what it yeah. was last year. I'll tell you yeah. that. Leighton Jordan looks like a sixth-round NFL draft pick. Jordan McGee looks like he's going to be a pro. Jalen McMurray is going to earn himself a chance to be somewhat special teamer or nickel in three or four years when he decides to go pro. Um, like That defense is good, and they had the potential to be at least this – to be close to this solid last season. Right. But Jeff Knowles, just as a defensive coordinator, I didn't understand the guy. The Temple gave up 220 rushing yards per game last season. 
and they stayed in a nickel defense. And it wasn't a 4-2 nickel. It was a 3-3-5 nickel. So they only had three down men, three stand-up three stand linebackers, one which they were always dropping back into coverage, and five DBs, and wondered why they couldn't stop a nosebleed. So um, <laughs> DJ Elliott has done a much better job than Jeff Knowles ever did at Temple. So, so the what, is the, what is the primary begins. scheme they're running now? They run a 3-4. They're very okay. multiple out of it, but they run a 3-4, um, and they're very attacking with it. They've got some bendy edge rushers like Leighton Jordan, like Trey Thomas, like Muheem McCargo, who's been a Swiss Army knife for the program ever since he's gotten here. He's been a safety. He's been a stand-up linebacker. And now he's an outside linebacker in a 3-4 that rushes and drops back into coverage. Um, so I think Temple's way better than what they were. They have promise now. It's just they've got to show up that offensive line. Yeah, one thing that, that Gus Malzahn has brought up in, in his media availabilities this week is just when, you, when you're a brand new coach taking over a program like Stan Drayton is and you've got some offensive issues, maybe you're starting a quarterback, you didn't know you were going to be starting, is when you have that bye week, that is so important just to get everyone on the same page to kind of take your breath, figure out what you do well. I know he said a year ago, when UCF had the bye week, you know, they were going and playing a freshman quarterback. You know, obviously that was his first year at UCF. He he felt they made so much improvement after that bye week, you know, for the games that followed. Is there is there a sense on offense that that anything can get going? I mean, this it's got to come at a good time to kind of take your breath. You, I guess they're, you know, they know they're going with EJ Warner the rest of the way. Is there some optimism that side can get better? I know you said the offensive line is banged up, which is never good, but are there any any bright spots to talk about going forward? They have playmakers on the outside, and EJ's got a high IQ. He's got a quick release. Um they just have to reconfigure their offensive scheme. Uh, I think they're going to have to be a very heavy pistol, shotgun, RPO team. Like, they can't run it straight up the gut on anybody and try to impose their will. Like, they're going to have to rely on a lot of pre-snap motion and a lot of reads to try to just distract the defense, get them off balance and off guard if they want to even attempt to run the ball. Um, and then passing, like I said, you don't want Warner getting hit. He's got a quick release. He processes things quickly. Two, three-step dropbacks, quick passing patterns. That's going to have to be Temple strategy going forward if they want to spark up that offense. But they're going to have to be very RPO heavy, like look like the definition of a 2022 college football team. Yeah, so to talk a little bit more about EJ uh, Warner playing quarterback, I mean, we're going to hear a lot about him on the broadcast. I know tomorrow they're going to play oh, yeah, up that Lewis angle. Oh, yeah, Lewis going to hammer him home. <laughs> they're going to let everyone know he's Kurt Warner's son. So, obviously, everyone knew the name when he came in. Was it surprising how the early season went? You said Dwayne Mathis, obviously. And he's not playing wide receiver, right? DeWan's playing wide receiver now. Yeah. Okay, so he's not even a quarterback. So this must have been something that maybe they were giving him a game just to just because he was the returning starter. Maybe that's what they were doing just to kind of see how he would do. But do you think that the coaching staff had kind of been thinking that, you know, that EJ was going to be the, the future and they were going to go to him sooner or later? Yeah, I think Stan knew EJ was a part of his plan somewhere down the line. Um, when, during the National Signing Day, he was talking about how impressed he was with EJ mentally. Like, the kid eats, sleeps, breathes football. EJ watches film with Kurt almost every night. Really? So a, a day for EJ Warner is wake up, get to the facility early, watch film by himself, work out, practice, then get the guys to come watch film with him, go to class, eat all that good jazz, go home, study, homework, and then he gets on a Zoom with Kurt. Really? And watch his film. So the, the guy's a worm. Like, he's, he's, a, he's a football junkie, which is great for a yeah. quarterback. Um, I think Stan knew he was going to be his, in his plans. By the, by the first week of the season, like by the week that they were preparing for Duke, EJ had jumped up to quarterback two on the depth chart, which I did not expect. I thought it was going to be Mathis and Patterson. You look at the Duke game. Mathis is still what I thought he was. And then Patterson, who's coming in from North Dakota State, can't necessarily throw the football. <laughs> That's not good. He's got arm talent. Like he can throw it 50, he, he can throw it 70 yards. It's just not accurate. But it's not accurate. Yeah. Like he threw the same out route twice against Duke. And it was the same result. Overthrown and not like it was too far to the sideline. No, like it was 
five yards over the receiver's head both times. So I'm like, okay, he can't throw. Who are they going to go to? Is it going to be Mariano Valenti and they redshirt EJ Warner just to have him in the future? And Lafayette comes and EJ's in the game. So, yeah, I mean, EJ's going to have to compete yeah. to keep his job next year when Ty- Tyler um, Douglas comes in from Ocean Township High School in New Jersey, dual threat quarterback. The guy actually looks like he can play. Um, yeah. So tell but me a little think, bit more. Here. Was, that, was that a big a big recruit in the recruiting class for 2023? Uh, uh, yeah, that... As far as 2023 quarterbacks go in the, you know, northeast and mid-Atlantic yeah. region, Douglas is a guy to look out for. Uh, he puts up numbers. every Like, he's like the Lamar Jackson of the region right now. Okay. Like, he's throwing in passing. And the, the, the kid puts up some crazy stats. So it's going to be interesting uh, to see him in spring practices when he gets up here, if he enrolls is, early. Yeah, um, is it, is Stan Drayton, is he considered a good recruiter? I think I remember when he was assistant that he was considered pretty good. How is he recruiting as a head coach at Temple? Um, He's only had one recruiting class. He turned it around very quickly, got some very decent prospects. Um, Adonica Sanders from Georgia Tech, Ian, Stan, Ian Stewart from Michigan State, uh, some Juco guys like Jacob Hollins, who's been performing this year, Trey Thomas, who's been performing. Um. He, he, he's done a pretty solid job, and we know what he was as a running backs coach, right, and how he recruited uh, Ezekiel Elliott, Carlos Hyde, B. John Robinson, Terry McLaurin, Curtis Samuel. Like, Stan Drayton's got some names under his belt, so recruiting won't be a problem for him whatsoever. Yeah, yeah. so to talk real quick again about E.J. Warner, what's, what's kind of been the biggest bright spot for him? Was there this? he had a moment or two on some of these? I know the offense hasn't been great this season but has he had a moment where you can kind of see like that kid's got got potential to be something special has there been any special moments so far for him or has it been kind of a struggle oh no when you talk about ball placement oof, ej warner's got something temple hasn't seen in a while i mean maybe pj walker like okay that this guy can put it where only the receiver can squeeze a ball into a tight spot and his receivers love him for it i mean those guys rave about him and again this is a 19 year old guy who's billed at six feet 190 right you see him in person you'll say that kid's only five ten a buck 70 soaking right like and he's got you know six one six two 200 pound guys just in awe of his talent and his iq and how he commands that huddle and that locker room and how he knows that playbook and how he can put the ball where it needs to go and just make the right decisions with the football when he has time, of course. Um, no, e- EJ's definitely had some bright spots. I, for one, have enjoyed watching him because since I've gotten to Temple and started covering the team, it's been Anthony Russo, Rial Mitchell, Dewan Mathis, um, Matt Duncan. Like, it has not been good quarterback play that I've covered <laughs> yeah. at all. So, EJ That's the is po- the post-PJ breath- Walker era, yeah. Yeah, e- EJ's a breath of fresh air. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me a little bit more. You were talking about this, this temple defense, obviously the strength of the team. I think they're number one in the country. I think they're tied with USC for the lead in sacks. I think they're averaging four a game, uh, number three in the nation on third down defense, number 20 in scoring defense. Why? I know you kind of talked about the, the, the new coordinator, new defensive coordinator, but who are some of the, the, some of the, the, the playmakers and some of the, the names that maybe fans should watch out for that are going to be making plays on Thursday for Temple on defense? I'll use one player as an example of why I'm so impressed with this defensive staff. Jalen Ware plays strong safety now. Last okay. season he was a free safety who I thought had some athleticism and some physical potential but was just empty in the head. Like, he'd make a good play and follow it up with a bonehead play right afterwards. I have one in particular for you. I can't remember what game it was. Catches a pick, runs into the end zone, comes out of the end zone, starts returning it, and then, boom, fumble. Loses the fumble. Team gets the ball back inside the 10-yard line. Like, stuff like that was what (laughs) Jalen Ware was known for. Jalen Ware is now one of the best players on that defense, and I look at him every week, and I'm like, oh, my goodness. The leap this guy has taken, he can actually play football. He's disciplined in coverage, looks for the ball, and then they bring him down into the box to blitz, and he is fast coming off the edge. Like, he's got some sacks under his belt this season. Like, the fact that they have been able to turn him like that just makes me look at that staff like, oh, my, okay. 
this defensive staff is better than I thought. Uh, Marvin Klesador, George Montanar, um, Antoine Smith, and of course, DJ Elliott himself. Like they've got a, a team over there. Alex Odom as his partner in crime is with the safeties. They don't let balls get behind them much. Jalen McMurray at corner, redshirt freshman. That kid can play. You want to talk about someone who's fundamentally sound in coverage and does not make mistakes? That's Jalen McMurray. Then again, he's been waking up since 530 to work out ever since the fifth grade with his dad. So I'd expect him to be disciplined. Okay. That guy can play corner. They've got Dominic Hill, a transfer from South Carolina, who's been getting better as the weeks go by. But Cameron Ruiz is getting healthier. He was good last season. The more snaps he gets, the better the defense performs. The linebackers, they fly around. I'm talking a whole bunch of physical, athletic, sideline to sideline guys. Kobe Wilson, Jacob Hollins, uh, Mahim Chicago when he's back there, uh, Vandy Rigby, and then the leader of the whole thing, Jordan McGee. Those guys can play. And then you look at the edge rushers, Trey Thomas, McCargo, and, and Leighton Jordan. They can have to the quarterback. They know how to get around that edge. And make life hard for you. And inside, they've got some heavies who know how to hold it up. Darian Varner is is a good pass rusher out of the 3-4. Jalen Satchel and Zach Gill, they know how to clog up lanes up front. Like that Temple's defense is legit. They're third in the conference um, in scoring defense for a reason. Yeah, I know people look at, at this matchup and just they, they see how Temple was last season. It's talking about UCF fans. They're thinking, oh, this is just going to be an, an easy game. But that defense is 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 legit. If if they can they can stymie UCF's offense for a little while, and, and maybe the offense it's light, you know, gets lightning in a bottle or something. The bye weekers. This this isn't going to be, I think, as easy as as some UCF fans may think. So if the offense is going to get it going, obviously we talked about a lot about EJ Warner. Who is a guy that really needs to go off if you want to see this offense finally, you know, do something? Who's who's a player that really needs to have a, a good game on offense for, for Temple to have a chance in this one? Whoever's playing center, because they've been rotating in and out who's snapping the ball. As long as the center has a good game, okay, Temple has a chance to be more productive on offense. Who will the playmakers be? If Warner has enough time to make his decisions, Jose Barbone, Adonicus Sanders, and the two tight ends, Jordan Smith and David Martin Robinson. All four of those guys, good route runners. They've got speed for their positions. Smith is actually one of those guys who started off at receiver, put on some weight, and moved inside the tight end. He's a matchup problem. Like He, he reminds me um, of, of when Darren Wilder first converted the tight end when he was in Baltimore. Like You can see those flashes. And Jordan Smith. David Martin Robinson, you wanted to talk about just a veteran with savvy, knows the playbook, knows where to be, and is a safety blanket. That's him. Jose Barbone can kill you with some speed out of nowhere. If he can get you on a double move or just get some leverage on you, you look behind you, and he's gone. And Adonica Sanders, I mean, his route running, he knows where to go, how to get there. He's got hands. He gets on face. He's going to pick up another seven yards for you at the very minimum each time. He knows how to avoid a defender and and rack up those yards after the catch. So those four guys would be the playmakers if it were to be, you know, an exciting offensive game, for example. Yeah, if you ask me uh, about UCF, the biggest thing to happen in UCF's program, they, they started in 1979. Uh, division three level went up all through the divisions went to fbs or 1a in 1996 but the biggest single thing that happened for ucf was having and building an on-campus stadium which opened in 2007 that was the thing that really got fan engagement to really increase the student body felt more connected to the program they had been playing at the citrus bowl which was near downtown Orlando. I think it was like a 13 miles away from campus. And so I know to that end, I know through the years they've always talked about, or Temple has talked about how they would love to have something on campus. Uh, they've been playing, you know, through the years at the vet, you know, then later on, obviously Lincoln financial field, you know, it's a beautiful stadium. I mean, I've been to multiple games there now. I, I went in uh, thir- uh, 13, seven, or yeah, 13, 17 and 21 i think those were the years i think those were the years i went uh but it's a beautiful beautiful facility for the nfl but you know for for temple you know it's too big it's just it's not a campus environment 
What's the latest on that? Because because I've heard it through the years. I think they signed a, an extension. I know the, the lease situation wasn't ideal. And they signed a lease, I think, that was going to take them through the 24 season. Is there any hope, any buzz at all that maybe one of these days something can get, get going for Temple to maybe get something on campus? So let, let's put this in perspective for people. Temple is in North Philly. Lincoln right. Financial Field is all the way off 95 in South Philly. Okay. Um, granted, you can take the Broad Street by train to down there and get there 20 to 30 minutes, depending on how the train's going that day. But it's not enticing to a bunch of college kids who yeah. just went out Friday night, you know, <laughs> not really feeling too good, get up the next morning, let's do it again. Oh, but wait, we got to get on the train and go all the way down to South Philly, right? That's how, how long of a train ride is that? Is that? About 20 to 30 minutes. Okay. So there's a bunch of stops and stuff, yeah. Yeah, just – bunch of stops and stuff and the drive isn't that long but you know college students yeah. will make any excuse not to do something right don't make it right. more more difficult than it needs to be right it, it, especially when the team doesn't hasn't had the success that it used to have um so that's number one through my own investigating and sourcing here's what i can tell you about plans for on-campus stadium they have a lot of temporary permits with the city that they need uh to be converted into permanent permits. That's number one. Number two, Temple's relationship with the community of North Philadelphia isn't the best right now. There's some broken promises that date back a few years. Community leaders aren't too happy with it. Some community leaders think the idea, the stadium would be a good idea to bring money to the area, get some jobs, get the area a safer place, all that good jazz. However, you know, can't really say that because how they'll be looked at by their fellow community members. Right. Whatever. Um, however, Jason Wingard, the president, Arthur Johnson, vice president and athletic director, they do want a stadium and they know exactly where they want to put it. It's just they've got to smooth the community over again, which they've been doing. Student athletes have been doing a lot more community service and the new NIL collective, the Tough Fund, um, is filed as a charitable um, organization, according to the IRS, okay. athletes who sign with them, their money is so. <laughs> going to come from. Their money is right. going to come from. Do a charitable act and get paid for it. So, okay, yeah, go ahead and make some money while also helping us restore our faith. You know, in the eyes of the community or whatever. Um, so they're working on it, but as of right now, those are the logistics of why there isn't a stadium on campus. Right. Well, they need one. They need to get butts and seats, which Arthur Johnson wants to do the basketball game against Villanova which will be in November 11th would have been broadcasted on either New Year's Eve or New Year's on CBS for a good amount of money Arthur Johnson tells them no my students aren't going to be in the seats for that we'll stick to our Friday night on see the Fox or ESPN one of them like everything he does is how bent on his first step and of his plan to get Temple back to glory get butts in seats. So he wants a stadium because a stadium yeah. will get butts in seats. Is, is that game, is, is the Villanova Temple game, is that always go rotate between campuses or is that played? Yeah, the, the, all it's, the big it's always five on campus. Is the the always, big five is always on campus? Yeah. Um, well, it used to be every game used to be played at Penn, at the Palestra. Okay. Pandemic happens. They've gotten away from that. And Arthur Johnson um, – isn't a fan of playing every game at the Palestra. He wants Temple games at Temple for fans to come out. So I don't see it going back to every Big Five game being at the Palestra from now on. Um, but, yeah, in the years that they're not at the Palestra, it goes back and forth. If Temple plays Villanova one year, they'll play them, uh, you know, at Villanova, and then the next year they'll play them at Temple, and it'll go back and forth. Same way with uh, Penn, LaSalle, and St. Joe's. Gotcha. And, then, and then in the City Six series, Drexel operates on the same way. Yeah. Since we're talking about Temple, Temple Hoops, uh, there's an interesting parallel between UCF and Temple because Jamil Reynolds, who was, you know, one of Johnny Dawkins recruits, had played in the last few years at UCF. You know, maybe, you know, I, I'll be curious to see what, what you've heard about him, but just maybe didn't realize his full potential, I think, kind of was the verdict to UCF. Maybe he was a little bit overweight. There is you know, some issues there. Didn't see a whole lot. Of, I mean, he played, but he wasn't one of the primary rotation players the past couple of years. 
you know, he hits the portal. It was, it was a little bit surprising. Um, you know, people thought that, you know, he was eventually going to, you know, become a, a starter level player at UC, but he hits the portal transfers the temple, which is interesting because we had a lot of those within the conference. We had a lot of AAC to AAC transfers. Yeah, Kendrick Davis leaving SNU to go to Memphis. Memphis. Clearly and the U biggest one. UCF's got a guy from East Carolina. UCF's guy's going to Temple. There's a bunch of other examples, yeah. but I know practice has just started. You know, we'll know more when the season starts in a few weeks. But Jamil Reynolds, have, have you guys heard any buzz of how he's doing in Philadelphia? Damian Dunn said Jamil Reynolds is a generational talent. Now, I do want to put in perspective, the way college work, well, basketball works, you typically, re like, your best recruits come from the position that your school is known for recruiting. Like, schools who aren't known for recruiting big men don't win big men. Like, big men is pretty much exclusively the, the, the Blue Bloods, of course, and Georgetown, you know? Like, those right. are the schools known for recruiting big men. If you're not them... Yeah, generational talent for you, for big men, means the guy can post up and score, right? Um, so I'm pretty sure that's what he means with Reynolds, but uh, Reynolds has a plethora and barrage of moves down there. He finishes strong. Uh, he's quick on his feet for a big guy. He can face up. It's just a matter of staying in shape um, and everything. And the team has already said they they make sure they stay on him about that. Coaches and staff um, – coaches and players alike. Uh, when – Johnny Dawkins and Aaron McKee had a phone call when Reynolds committed. Uh, before McKee took him, Johnny, what, what's the deal on this guy? Right. Johnny Dawkins told Aaron McKee, Jamil Reynolds can be a pro. If he just, if he stays dedicated and figures it all out, there is no reason Jamil Reynolds shouldn't be a professional basketball player. So that's the verdict on him. I'm excited to see him. Me personally, I'm a very, very old school guy with my basketball. I hate analytics. If you can't shoot the three, I don't see why you're taking the three. Take the mid-range. I hate the, the fact that the mid-range is dead. I hate foul searching and whatever happened to feeding the big man. So I'm very excited to see what Jamil Reynolds can do down low. So I love me some post-scoring. So, so what, what's the general outlook for, for Temple? I, I, I got to pull it up. What were, they, what were they predicted this morning? I know the preseason poll came out. Fifth, but if okay. it were up to me, if I had a vote, Temple would have come in third for me. I don't think Memphis – did anything to deserve that second spot. Like, I don't think they should have made the tournament last year. I really don't. Lost Jalen Duran. Brought back, they brought in Kendrick Davis. The returning guys and the other guys they have, I just don't see it. And Penny, I guess he's a decent recruiter because of his name. Yeah. But he's not a good X's and O's coach. <laughs> not at no, I, I he, agree with you. He's not. And this program doesn't really have much culture. If it were up to me, I would have had Houston one. I would have had Tulane second. Tulane's got a good team. And I would have had Temple third because they lost last season's series to Tulane one to three. I would have put Cincinnati four because they got swept by Temple last season. But I really do like Wes Miller as a head coach, and I really see something in Cincinnati's future. I, I wish them, UCF, and Houston were staying in their American a little longer because I'm very interested to see what they become. Um, but I would have put – Memphis at five, Cincinnati at six, Wichita State at seven, East Carolina at eight, and then you can yeah, figure which, out. Wichita there. State is is the program. Everyone brought him in. You know, everyone thought they were coming in. I know they had the whole Greg Marshall situation, and he was kind of forced out with his conduct. But they kind of they haven't really performed to I think what the American you know thought they were going to be when they invited them. Maybe they're finding out you know life in a tougher conference isn't. Is it quite as easy as it was in their previous one? But and they started off decent until the Marshall stuff happened. But Isaac yeah. Brown got them to the tournament the year yeah. that he took over. That's what got that interim tag removed from his title. Um, and then last year, you know, down year. But yeah, you, you're not going to dominate the American every yeah. year like you yeah. used to dominate the Missouri Valley. That's just not going to happen. But I do think Wichita State is definitely still going to be a program where it's like, yeah, two out of every four years, there'll be a tournament team. Yeah, Aaron, uh, Aaron, Aaron McKee at Temple. He just he seems like the perfect fit, like to be the head coach. I mean, what is, what, how long has he been there? Like three years now since Fran retired. Uh, like, what's kind of the reception? I mean, is, is ever this is Aaron's fourth year. That he's fourth year, okay, to. gotcha, gotcha. What's kind of the reception to to how he's been perceived? Obviously, he's got the ties and everything. Uh, how do people like him in Philly? You know, everyone loves Aaron around here. I mean, he's an all time great at Temple. Had a very very good NBA career. Knows how to coach. He 
he is like you can tell which one of Cheney's guys like really took Cheney the most seriously. You know what I'm saying? Like all of Cheney's guys loved him and revered him and all that. But you go to a temple practice, and Mark Adams said it today. Like you hear Cheney in McKee. Um, and now he's got the roster shaped to where he wants it to be. Damian Dunn said it's tournament a bus for Temple this year. A lot of guys feel that way. Caleb Battle is normally a happy go lucky guy. I haven't seen happy go lucky Caleb in in weeks. He's been locked in. I'm I'm going crazy. And in the history of basketball, when the guy who's a good player and friendly with everyone turns on that switch to yeah, all the smiles and giggles are gone. They become a very dangerous player. Caleb Battle averaged 21.4 points per game last season in those seven games before he was out for the rest of the season with that foot injury. If that guy is going from Mr. Happy Camper to I'm locked in, don't talk to me, it's straight basketball, it's straight business, that's a scary sight. Hey, we'll, we'll wrap it up in a second. Uh, but are you a Philly guy? Did you grow up in Philadelphia? Or are you from the area? Or? No, I'm a, I'm a Baltimore guy through and through. Okay, Baltimore. Okay, I, to, I mean, maybe you can answer this. I, is is the town really Philly's crazy right now? First playoff appearance, I think, in over 10 years. I, I don't know what happened. I know as we were recording, I know there was a rain delay going on. But how, how crazy are things right now with uh, Philly's excitement? Oh, it, it's, it's red October. The Eagles are great right now. Um the Phillies are in the playoffs, and they took a game from the Braves that I didn't think they'd be able to take. Like, and and, and they got the Cardinals up out of there in two games. Like, the Phillies are, they they've got the mojo. They got hot at the right time, and we know baseball's playoffs are about getting hot at the right time. So, um, there's energy around here. Of course, th- these fans up here they they lie to themselves about the Sixers every year. Like, we all know the Sixers <laughs> aren't going to make it past the second round this year. But, you know, and they know it too, but they're going to lie to themselves and give themselves the hope. And the Sixers make their debut six days from now. So, and, and the Union are the best team in Major League Soccer. Like, no, no, Philly, the sports town, is a crazy place to be right now. They're, they're, they're happy. They're loving. No one's been rude up here for a couple of weeks. Like, you know what? If this is what happens <laughs> when Philly sports teams are good, I'm for it. Feel free. It's a good environment up here right now. So for someone who's obviously living in Philly, I always got to ask this. Who has the best cheesesteak? Because that's always a debate when everyone goes to Philly. There's so many places. I've been to John's Roast Pork, which isn't too far from the stadium. Uh, I've been to Las Patas, a few other places. As someone who's been living there a few years, who, what's your go-to spot? If you, if you, if you eat cheesesteak, that is. I'll say this. As a Baltimore guy, as an inner city guy, I completely understand that if you are not from said city, you cannot say what the best place is to get their staple. That's fair. So I won't say what the best one is because I haven't even gone to Max's, like, and that's supposed to be the best one. Like, it's not Pat's or Geno's. I'll tell you. Yeah, that no, there's a tourist traps. Jim's on South Street is pretty good. Jimmy G's was on Broad before it closed down. That was pretty good. But the best cheese sticks to get um, from you know true Philadelphians, they'll tell you you got to go to the Poppy store might be called the corner store where you're from or the bodega for some people, but that's where you're supposed to get your best cheese steaks from. So out of respect for Philadelphia, I won't say which one. (laughs) You're not going to speak for Philly, but I know which ones I go to. And it's normally gyms as of right now or, or Larry's because Larry's isn't half bad either, but it's like, yeah. And like people from that's not from Baltimore, they can't tell me what the best chicken box is like, no, you're not (laughs) from the city. So you can't tell me what our best dish is. So, um, or, or where our best crab cakes come from, you know? So um, I, I, I'll be very respectful to the great <laughs> city of Philadelphia right here. Gotcha. I'll end with this, uh, pivoting back to simple football. What would a successful season look like to you? Obviously, what, two and three record right now? I got some tough games ahead. First season with a new coach, new quarterback. Offense is trying to get it going. Defense looks good. So just kind of long-term looking at the next couple months, what would a successful season for Temple look like to you? Yeah, so Temple, for me, they've beaten who they're supposed to. My thing was for them to have a season that exceeded my expectations, I needed them to beat either Duke or Rutgers. I thought it would be Duke until I got down there and I saw what Mike Alco and Kevin Johns have done with that program. Yeah, Rutgers should have been a win. 
if Stan Drayton was as ballsy, wasn't as ballsy as he is. Um, so I guess if they can reach four wins, that'll show me, all right, at least Temple can beat who they're supposed to, which means beating Navy in South Florida, of course. I'm not going to ask them to beat Tulsa right now, even though they can. They still have a path to bowl eligibility. If they beat Nova in South Florida and they beat Tulsa, it's going to come down to the last game of the season for them because I don't think they beat UCF Thursday night. I just don't. They've got a stretch before East Carolina. Back-to-back games, they go to Houston, and then they come home for Cincinnati. That's tough to ask Temple yeah. to beat. Even though Houston's having one of those years where they're going to have two or three losses that they had no business looting, losing, if Temple can steal that, that's big for them. I'll say it's a great season for them. But my thing is, I think as it, can, as it stands, if they can – beat Tulsa and get the five wins right there. If they can somehow counteract all that negative mojo that will be in the facility after the two losses to Houston and Cincinnati, which won't be fun losses, and they can somehow beat ECU and get the six wins and be bowl eligible in Drayton's first season, that will be a great year. But a good year for Temple right now, to me, beat Navy, beat South Florida, finish four and eight. That'll be good enough for me. All right, Javon, I appreciate it, man. I, I didn't mean to keep you over 40 minutes, but you were such a fun guy to talk to. I really enjoyed the conversation and learning more about the Temple Owls. Uh, thank you for your time and uh, best, uh, best of luck to you and, uh, and Temple. Oh, absolutely. Anytime.